The last words of King David. The last words of King David. Hear these words. Then David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, are the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and on the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and it is in your hand to make great and to give strength to all. And now, our God, we give thanks to you and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able to make this freewill offering? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. For we are aliens and transients before you, as were all our ancestors. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no hope. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you search the heart. And take pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here, offering freely and joyously to you. O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our ancestors, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to my son Solomon that with single mind he may keep your commandments, your decrees, and your statutes, performing all of them, and that he may build the temple for which I have made provision. Then David said to the whole assembly, Bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and bowed their heads and prostrated themselves before the Lord and the king. On the next day they offered sacrifices and burnt offerings to the Lord, a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, and a thousand lambs, with their libations and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. And they ate and drank before the Lord on that day with great joy. This is God's word for us this morning. So these are the revered last words of King David. King David, a person who literally had it all. He ruled over the United Kingdom of Israel. He had everyone and everything at his beck and call, all at his disposal. More than any of us, more abundance than any of us could ever dream or imagine. So as he comes to the end of his journey, what does he think? Well, we notice in these last words that even though David believed and worshipped a global God, he knew ultimately that that God was a local God. That is, the God that's universal comes, becomes known to us personally. David knew that ultimately he was locally owned because God was near and God was in the particulars and interested in the particulars of who he was and how he lived. That's why I think at the last words he's really taking a complete inventory of everything. And friends, this is our call. Our call is to take a complete inventory of all that God has given and who God calls us to be. It's difficult. It's difficult to read these words. I've often thought maybe reading these words and certainly preaching on these words should come with a, a warning. The Surgeon General has determined that these words uh, may not uh, suit very well with you. Or parental discretion advised or something along those lines. Because they are challenging words. But just for a few moments, as we seek to be individually and corporately who God has called us to be, Let's take this complete inventory like King David. Three affirmations that come from our scripture today. Well, first of all, what you have is not your own. What you have is not your own. David proclaimed that here in Chronicles time after time after time. Lord, anything that we've done, anything that we've built for you, we're just giving back to you what already belongs to you. Now, that may seem very simple observation to many, but friends, it is absolutely vital to the way of discipleship and stewardship in our own lives. I will add it is absolutely vital for you finding the joy and purpose that God has for you. To know locally, that is in the particulars of your life, that God is present. You have to be able to acknowledge that you do not own a thing. 
that it all comes from God. Every single part of it. Now, you know the truth, don't you? The truth is, if we think we own what we have, what you have will eventually own you. If you think you own what you have, and it doesn't belong to God, then those things will eventually own you. That's so vital to know who the real owner is. I remember an older gentleman, he's a farmer, he owned several hundred acres on my first circuit in Upshur County, surrounding the church in Parsonage where I lived. And on more than one occasion, this farmer who raised a, a glorious garden, huge garden, on more than one occasion, he said, now, preacher, there's plenty of things over there in that garden. You just go in there and get what you want whenever you want it. Well, now, are you sure, Wilson? You sure? Oh, yeah. Just go in there. Take what you need. Glad for you to have it. I thought, man, that is a giving attitude. I found out a little later afterwards he owned several hundred acres, and there were people who were much poorer than him that lived on the margins of his farm in different areas there. And I noticed that a lot of those people had gardens, but they were across the fence from where they lived, the garden. I finally found out from a person in the community that, that all that property actually belonged to this farmer. But for those who were living, bordering him, he said to them, you want to plant a garden? Come on over on my property and plant as big a garden as you want. That was his attitude. And I finally found out why, because his favorite statement, once we started sort of talking about this and making jokes about me showing up in his garden at all kinds of different times, he would say to me, preacher, I'm not the giver, I'm the passer. I'm not the giver, I'm the passer. That was his attitude. He said to me, I'm not the one who's given these things. God gives everything. I just pass her along to you. <laughs> I just pass her along to you. He knew that what he had was not his own. And that influenced not only how he lived, but what he believed. That's the first affirmation that's vital, vital for us finding joy and purpose in life. What you have is not your own. Secondly, you are what you give away. This is more challenging to hear, perhaps, that our identities are formed by our giving patterns. That's very difficult to hear. David knew it. That's what he's proclaiming here in Chronicles. That has sort of declined in interest in our culture today. In fact, there was a Gallup poll not long ago that reported results. And back in 1989, 75% of the population gave to charitable causes. 1995, 69% gave to charitable causes. 2010, 61% gave to charitable causes. The last figure they had was 2018, 58%. You can see the trend. And it really shouldn't surprise us, though, should it? Because the culture in which we live sort of encourages a self-centered type of living, that I want to keep what is mine. Ah, don't forget affirmation number one. Friends, what we give away will form our identity more than you ever dreamed or imagined. And it certainly will form you spiritually, spiritually in your connection with God. But we're taught to sort of hold on to things, aren't we? Joe Garagiola, he was a famous baseball catcher and also famous sportscaster a number of years ago. He tells the story that when he was a, a, um, a catcher, they were playing the St. Louis Cardinals, and one of the greatest hitters of all time was a guy by the name of Stan Musial. And he said Stan Musial came to the plate, and Joe being the catcher, he signaled to his pitcher. He signaled curveball. Pitcher shook it off. So he signaled a changeup. Pitcher shook it off. Finally, Joe Garagiola says, I signaled for a fastball. Pitcher shook his head no. So he goes, I come out from behind the plate. I run out to the pitcher's man. He goes, I I'm signaling everything in the world. What's going on? And the pitcher looked at him and he said, I want to hold on to this as long as I can. Musuals at the plate. That's kind of our attitude, isn't it? We want to hold on to things. 
thinking that we find security in them, thinking we find prosperity there, thinking it will increase us when actually the opposite is true. We are defined by what we give away. Martin Luther said that when you come to Christ, there are three conversions, the conversion of the heart, the conversion of the mind, and the conversion of the purse. I remember an elderly woman when I served in Clarksburg. She was the widow of one of our retired pastors. She was shut in, homebound. Her income, of which I had firsthand knowledge through her family, was $12,000 a year. This is the late 80s, early 90s. $12,000 a year. You think, boy, somebody on fixed income. Huh? Every month she would call me, I would go to visit her, and she would give me $100 for that month. One-tenth. And then she'd give me a $5 bill and say, this is for the young people. This is for the young people. She had already formed a very basic identity, a faith-centered identity, whereas she was able to freely, freely, give away that which God had already given her. That's the second affirmation, to know you are what you give away. Finally, a more complete inventory will one day be taken. Now, each affirmation gets a little more challenging, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, uh, this particular affirmation because it's really uncomfortable. In fact, you should be up here looking back if you know how uncomfortable it is. A more complete inventory. That's not something that's popular in our culture. The word is accountability. That one day we will account for what we have done with what we have. Friends, in our faith walk, this is consistent from the Old Testament. You see it here in Chronicles. Right on through the New Testament, you've heard the scripture verse from the Apostle Paul, you reap what you sow. Accountability runs as a thread through the scripture, but oftentimes not something we want to pay attention to because it is very challenging. But I've often found that feelings of being uncomfortable and challenged lead to the greatest growth in the Christian life. So another, a complete inventory will one day be taken. I'll close with this story. I, many of you know this past week I, I preached a series of four revival services at my home church in Nicholas County, and it was good to be back there uh, those four nights. But as I was in that little church, a lot of different memories uh, came back to me. And one of those, as I walked into one of the, the classrooms that's still there today, I remember when I was a youth, uh, there were two or three of us in class is all we had, and uh, our teacher was sick that morning, and so no one was available to teach our Sunday school class, so they just said, you guys can just go in the men's Bible class. That was the classroom next, next to us. So all of us shuffled into the men's Bible class. I don't know who was more uncomfortable, uh, them or us, I'm not sure. But I can remember the teacher telling the story from the lesson, and it's an old story, and you've probably heard it, but I had a flashback to it, and I want to share it with you because it relates directly to this affirmation. Remember the guy told the story. He said there was a man quite wealthy. He had a hired hand that had worked for him for a number of years. And the man decided to take a vacation to Europe for four or five months, but before he left, he said to his hired hand, listen, I have this account here that I'm going to give you charge of because I want you to build the best house we've ever built. The hired hand thought to himself, another house? Doesn't he have enough? But the man said to him, now while I'm gone, I don't want you to spare any expense. Here's the design. I want it to be the absolute best house that you could possibly think of. So that's what the hired hand set to do while the man was on vacation. But as he started, he thought to himself, you know what? I've worked for this guy all these years, and I'm going to retire in a couple of years. I have nothing to show for it. So what he did was is he cut corners. He used inferior materials that didn't cost as much and pocketed the difference. He started using things that were cheaper, cutting those corners. And he thought to himself, you know what? I'll be retired in a couple of years. By the time the defects show up, I'll be long gone. And so he built the house, and the facade looked very good. It looked wonderful. The time came for the owner to return. And he said to the hired hand, wow, what a wonderful job you've done on this house. The hired hand said, thank you very much. And then the man took the door keys, and he gave them to the hired hand and said, now this is your house. You've worked for me for nearly 40 years, and I know that you're about to retire, and I wanted you to have 
the very best house to live in. It's all yours. Maybe we say what goes around comes around, but ultimately the word is accountability. A more complete inventory will one day be taken. Friends, it's my prayer for you individually, and it's my prayer for us collectively, that as challenging as it may be, understanding that the Lord God desires your spiritual growth, that you have both the wisdom and the courage to take a complete inventory. What you have is not your own. You are what you give away, mindful that one day a more complete inventory will be taken. May God give us that wisdom and that courage that in all things we may be found faithful. Let us pray. Lord, we do give you thanks and praise. Even when your words are challenging and we are a bit uncomfortable, we know that ultimately you always have our good in mind. Just as your servant David acknowledged before you, the blessings that have come from you and the source of all that we have. May you grant us this same wisdom today that we might grow together spiritually and that we might produce fruit for your kingdom. It's in Christ.